going on, everybody? This is the ChondroCast, the podcast for green tree pythons and the people that keep them. I'm your host, Justin Smith of Palmetto Coast Exotics. Enjoy the show. Yeah, you know, it was it was funny because I was like... I talked to a few people about it before I did it. I was like, man, I don't want, you know, Buddy or Bill to think that I'm trying to, like, swoop in and, like, steal their thing. And Harlan was like, well, you know, talk to Bill about it and make sure they're cool with it. And if they are, then do it. And I was like, all right. And, yeah, uh, I mean, I thought that was a very classy move. You don't need Buddy or I's permission to do a, a Green Tree podcast, um, but it was cool that you at least oh, yeah, yeah. Well, got, our, I mean, got, got our input. And, of course, we're – Obviously, I'm on the show. I'm, I'm more than supportive. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I want to see you do well um, with this podcast. One of the, you know, one of the problems with our show is the, is you know, it's just, we just do it so infrequently. Right. And that was kind of the thing when I decided to do it. I was like, you know, there is only so much you can talk about with green trees, but if you make it more of like getting people's opinions on how they do things and sort of the slight changes and their perspectives on different on, on different things uh you know it might make it a little more interesting and i did it hoping that it would help out you know fill in any blanks of people wanting more chondro content in between you guys you know your show and stuff like that so it was i didn't that was my big thing when i decided to do it because i had been tossing the idea around for a while you know after doing thp for a while i was like man i really want i would do chondro episodes every episode if we could <laughs> if, you, if you could huh? jake would <laughs> lose his mind <clears throat> so Right. Well, the I, uh, other thing is, is there's nothing wrong with, you know, repetitiveness in, you know, these situations. Yeah. Um, you know, people just can't hear, you know, they they digest it better when they hear it multiple times from multiple sources. Definitely. So, you know, you know, that's sweet. We've got a pretty, if you've listened to any of our shows, we've got a pretty standard format. You know, we mm-hmm. ask about husbandry and, you know. All the things that you've talked about in your episode so far, and to get different people's stories is, um, you know, I mean, it's it's fun. It's fun to listen to different different people telling maybe similar uh, things, but in a different way. Yeah. It's also, uh, you know, I, I asked a few people, too, before I did it. I was like, man, if somebody else, like, if I started another Green Tree podcast, like, would you listen, even though some of the material would be very similar, if not the same, to what people have talked about on, on GTP Keeper? And they were like, yeah, of course, like, yeah. without a doubt. Like, they're like, I just want to hear people talk about Condros. And I was like, okay, I guess yeah. we'll do it. I'll make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. It does I mean, it doesn't surprise me one bit. I mean, uh. Because I felt so. the same way. Like, if there was another podcast that came out about Green Tree Pythons, I'd be listening to it, too, even if it was, you know, the same person was on two different shows, you know, in a week. I'd still be listening to both of them. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, we may have some crossover in the shows, but, you know, your your guest list has already been, you know, quite a bit different than ours. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean... I think Evan's the only Dave David Brom has been on our show. Yeah. Um and Evan was on our show, but Mark has not been on our show and I kinda look down the episodes that you that you have done and I mean uh, again there there wasn't a whole lot of crossover. Yeah. But I think that's kind of the thing with, with Reptile Podcast in general right now. You know, everyone I know when we started T H P I was like, Well, you know, you have Joe and Melissa's show and it was like we got to make sure we don't have the same person on too close to like their episode, but I've I've come to find that that's not even a problem. You know, we if it is if it's someone like you who came on THP, like you were on from the ground up, like what, uh, like a year and a half ago. Yeah, it's been a, at least a year. Yeah, so it was like surely there's something that has changed between now and then that we can you know talk sure. about and all that good stuff. So I don't know, I don't worry about it too much, and it's nice to know like you're in that group, the podcast messenger thing that we got going on now where all the podcasters are in one little thread together and it's it's cool that it's yeah that it went that direction instead of it being like a competition and everyone trying to you know get firsts on stuff and 
trying to beat people to the punch. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And I do not, I have not had, because of my uh, work, my career, I've not had a lot of time to listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. But that was always the case with uh, NPR and us. You know, we always had a very mutual respect and understanding. Um, well, part of the reason is because Buddy and I are, I mean, we're very good friends with Eric and Owen. But even if we weren't, you know, I think just the, you know, the relationship would have always been good. Yeah, definitely. Because it all just goes back to, you know, if you're, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. If it's something herp related, there's going to be people that will listen to it regardless. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you take it a step farther. Um, I'm just as fascinated and interested in the people as yeah, I am the animals. Yeah. And that was, you know? that was the thing that I really kind of wanted to focus on with this is like, we, you know, the Condra community is fairly small. We see a lot of these names in the groups, but we don't really have anything to really associate with that person. And so it's like, well, if I like, yeah, we, we only have a finite thing, number of things to talk about, about green trees, but like I said, kind of talking to the person, getting more of their opinions on different things and sort of where they're standing on stuff, you know, how they like to do things sort of, you know, opens it up a lot more and makes it a little more uh, easier to easier to accommodate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. So, But um, we are already going. Welcome, everybody. This is Episode 7 of the ConjureCast. I'm Justin Smith of Palmetto Coast Exotics. Uh, please subscribe via SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. Uh, follow me on Facebook and Instagram at the Cast. And tonight I'm joined with Mr. Bill Stiegel of Phoenix Reptiles. What's up, dude? Justin, how are you, my friend? I'm good, man. How's retirement? <clears throat> retirement, in a word, is awesome. <laughs> I think I'm going on, uh, let's see, my last official day. As a physician was January 31st, so I'm going on almost two months now of of uh, retirement. And gosh, I say retirement, but um, I cannot believe how busy I've been in in the snake world. I mean, it's I can't believe I really essentially did this full time with my anesthesia practice for yeah. probably two years. You know. Yeah. Um, it's been really, really good, and uh, I just wanted to take a minute to uh, congratulate you on the success of your show. Uh, I've listened Thank to you. a couple of episodes, and uh, and uh, they're fantastic. And we talked earlier, I don't know if any of it was on the pre-recorded part of the show, um, about how, you know, I think there can be a really good symbiotic relationship between your show and our show, GTP Keeper Radio. Mm-hmm. I hope so. I, that was like like I mentioned. Uh, you know, I really I, the first thing I thought when I decided I was going to do it was like, man, there's going to be so many people that think I'm trying to like get in on that and try and you know, quote unquote, steal that or anything like that. And it was just, I have a lot of I have I have a good bit of time in between work. Well, I say that, but I have I my reasoning is like I have the ability to do a podcast. I have the time and I have the equipment to do it. So I feel like if I'm not using that to help the hobby more, then I'm kind of letting that sort of go to waste. Well, you're, you know, one of the many things you're doing is you're facilitating information. And well, that's the big thing, too. <clears throat> you know, that's one of the things. There's so many bad things about social media. Um, but one of the good things is, is the availability of the information now is mm -hmm. just skyrocketed through the roof and it's because of podcasts and really in, in social media. Definitely. Do you think sort of as far as that goes, like the, the good outweighs the bad in a sense? Like I feel like there's, a, there's plenty of good information and it's going to take a little more effort to find, but there's probably just as much good information if you look hard enough than there is bad Yes, I agree. It's a it's a double edged sword. Um, one of the things that we have done with social media is we have all but killed the the internet forums. Yeah, and um, that's certainly true with the big Morelia forum that Sean Christian started, and it's 
becoming more and more true with the MVF, the Morelia Viridis Forum. Mm -hmm. Um, the activity on those sites, well, the, the carpet Python pages, as far as I know is, is, you know, it's pretty much non-existent. Yeah. The MVF is still existent, but the posting and the sharing there is way, way down. So that's certainly a huge negative because like you said, all that information is logged and can be searched. And, um, so I that's... think that's certainly a disadvantage yeah but it's nice uh, that it's still media. there like you can still that you can still go through the you know the archives of years and years and years of people posting on there and uh, i guarantee it you is. if there's a problem it's probably been asked on there and you could find it if you dig deep enough it's there for now until you know until the sites go defunct um but yeah it's there for now hmm all right. Well, I've got. I think this is. I didn't. This is going to be a pretty substantial episode because I've got a pretty good bit of questions here. Well, you know, it's. Um, I haven't been on the other side of the microphone, so <laughs> to speak, in, in in quite a while. So go easy on me. All right. It's pretty nice, though, isn't it? Like you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to like keep track of anything. You're just you get to kick back and. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, if you've listened to any of our episodes. Um, we like to get really um, good guests on, mm -hmm. and usually we'll load up with one or two, and then you know we just turn them loose, and Buddy and I pretty much just sit back and enjoy yeah. the show. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's a Harlan episode, then you don't have to talk at all. <laughs> if it's the Harley or the Cody Bartolini episode, yep, yep, then yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, not a word is uttered. But that I mean, I don't complain. That makes it easy. And I mean, with Harlan though. <laughs> Like, it doesn't bother me at all, because it's not like he's just rambling and, like, you know, talking highly of himself and all that stuff. It's, like, actually good info. It's just the only issue is you can't keep track of it all fast enough. I know. His his mind um, his mind moves a lot quicker than mine does. Yeah. I will tell you, I did listen to... Um, I did listen to the, sh the last show you did today with, with Evan, mm -hmm. Evan Broder, and I, I saw on Facebook the boys... I guess he's sick today, so we'll uh, we'll have to have a good episode and and try to cheer him up and get him back to feeling better. But I was cracking up, man, listening <laughs> to <laughs> listening to him keep, you know, how he described keeping his first chondro. Yeah. Three. <laughs> he had three imported animals in some. I'm just trying to picture it. Just some elaborate giant. Uh, you know, homemade setup with a nasty log and a waterfall and yeah, you know, water turtles and you know, I mean, I was just cracking up. Um, and and the fact that the chondros didn't do well in that environment, it was so funny because that's what so many people think. You know, the people that don't have a lot of um, experience with mm -hmm. chondros, most of them want that naturalistic setup you know, and, and it can be done. I have no experience with it. I'm a very basic, uh, uh, ba basic, uh, yeah. keeper as far as husbandry. I know it can be done, but boy, I think you have to have a lot of experience with the condors before I, I attempt that kind of setup. And so I thought it was, I got a couple of laughs out of, uh, Evan's description of it. Yeah, and that's actually one of the questions I was going to ask you. Which, what, and I've I've seen the vid, like the the bar check video where they they kind of showed your collection in your room a little bit, so I know the answer. But you you prefer to keep them simple, like you you do the the non hipstery method that doesn't anger everybody, or that that does anger everybody. <laughs> it depends who you ask. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'm very basic. These things. Um, can be very very easy to keep you put them in the right uh, setup and mm -hmm. you know you guys discussed all of this um you know the reasons to you know keep them in a pvc uh environment yeah. a pvc cage because of heat and humidity um and and the reason that i like you know i use my substrate is either paper towels newspaper or puppy pads and I love the puppy pads. I use the puppy pads all the time. Puppy, puppy pads are great. Puppy pads are great because they they'll hold 
water. They'll keep humidity high in the cage if mm-hmm. you need it. And if there's, you know, a flake of mold growing in that cage on the puppy pad, you'll see it. Yeah. Because those things are bright white. Mm-hmm. And I think mold in a green trees environment is a huge predisposer for those things getting respiratory infections. Mm-hmm. And if you got a bunch of spe- sponge and moss or, you know, bark in there, it's hard to see. Right. You know, it, it's hard to see mold. So I'm a very simplistic keeper. I'm much more focused on the animal than the environment that they're in. I mm-hmm. would much rather look at the green tree than the leaves or the bark or the pond in there. You know, if I want to see that crap, I'll go outside, you know, and, and, and look at flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just open my blinds I'm, if I want to see that stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> right. I'm much more concerned with the animal. Um, so that's, you know, that's the way that I go. And, and I do think that the more animals you have in your collection, it's just very, very difficult to keep on top of that. If, if you just had one or two green trees, yeah. um, I think you could be a little bit more diligent. Uh, and I know you can because it's been done. There are people that are very mm-hmm. successful keeping the, the naturalistic uh, setups, but it's just something I don't have any experience Brian doing. Brian Fisher's all about it. Yeah, yeah. Me, me and him talk about it on a pretty regular basis. Yeah, I mean, it can be done, uh, and it can be done well and properly. I think it's something, and you guys hit on this, it's not something you throw a, a hatchling into yeah, or a neonate. Yeah, definitely not. You know, you'd want a pretty well-established animal, and, uh, you know, it it can be done. Now, you know, I'm sitting on about 40 chondros here. For me to do that um, and to do it right Mm -hmm. would not serve me or the animals well. Yeah. Well, I guess that that leads into the next part. But uh, so, you're you, how many of those of those four do you have? Or, or like, what's the ratio of adults to neonates? To um, I've got I've got five neonates that uh, I've held on to uh, from a recent uh, clutch, um, and I'll probably thin a couple of those out as as time goes on. That's mm-hmm. uh, from a repeat pairing uh, where the sickness came from. So yep. I've, I've got five of those. Uh, I've got uh, four or five animals from my prior clutch that I produced that I've held on to, and that was uh, one of the animals that Evan got, in fact. He got a p- recently picked up a female from my uh, blue cy- cyclops uh, girl. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the rest of those are pretty much adults. Nice. So yeah, it uh, what was it Jason. Uh, what's his last name? Takashi. Steve. Oh yeah, Jason. Uh huh. Yeah, he got what that yellow baby he got from you. With that, the, I it's think like the Jason, blaze. blaze yeah, the blaze that, looking that kid. That was, was one of yours, right? Yeah, it was, and in fact, it's a sibling to one of the ones that Evan got. It's a sickness repeat pairing. Oh okay. Uh, kind of very unusual that that pairing and i've done it twice now Mm -hmm. produces heavy heavy dominant red in other words i mean i think the first time i had 23 babies 20 were red three were yellow and the second time i did it i got like 20 babies and four were yellow but every single time the yellow has been this what's called a blaze Mm mm-hmm face yellow which is just yellow with a really pronounced red stripe down the back yeah it has like this um, burnt orange looking sort of look to yeah it right down the exactly. spine yeah they're really exactly. cool looking <clears throat> yeah they're really neat i don't think it transitions to anything in, into adulthood mm-hmm. um but usually that that blaze area uh fades at least what i've seen in the updated pictures um, yeah. but it's a really really cool looking uh, uh baby neo and you know they keep that look for a couple two three years and is that female wamena that you you produce the sickness with is that the only wamena you have or do you have others that's the only w- wamena locality type that i have now now the big push is to not refer to them as wamena but to refer to them as highland type 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Get hit with the <laughs> because, lingo. <clears throat> because evidently there is no Wamina. I, I think Wamina is an airport or something mm-hmm. over there. Um, so well, I still call her the Wamina. I was going to say, whatever it is, it sounds like if you pair anything to that locality, it th- it throws some pretty crazy stuff. Yeah, I mean, there are so many locality types that throw crazy stuff, um, and Wamina is certainly one of them. Cyclops is another. Mm-hmm. Beox another. You know, you guys talked about, and I think um, Evan was mentioning the fact that there are so few locality type um, animals produced every year, and it's simply because of the fact that the outcrosses look so crazy. Yeah, I think that's um, that's the part of the appeal is just people you don't know what you're going to get, like, and nobody knows what you're going to get. It's not like ball pythons, which you have experience with, where you know you compare these two things and you you know you're fairly certain what to expect. You know, with condos, right, right, it's exactly. just, you, you, nobody knows. Like, the, the best guy in the hobby isn't going to know what that baby's going to look like. They can have an idea of what it might look like, but it could still go a completely different direction. I think that's kind of the appeal, because it was sort of the same way with crested geckos for me when I was breeding those. Uh, yeah. You know, I'd, I'd take two geckos from opposite, opposite ends of the spectrum and put them together, and you just you wouldn't know what you would get. And that was part well, that's, of the appeal. You might, you might hit something like the sickness, or you might completely strike out. Yeah, and that's exactly the appeal for me to work with designers because um, I'm kind of a, a bit of a Franken, Dr. Frankenstein yeah. character. <laughs> really, all this stuff that I've done, and, and I used to do a lot of carpets, and I still breed carpets, um, but I was always looking for, you know, crazy, to produce crazy stuff. And mm-hmm. uh, they're not that I cared, but there's some people in the carpet community that kind of shun that. Oh, that, yeah. You know, you should not breed subspecies and you know you want to make sure the lineage is pure with your jungles and coastals and all that but in the green tree community you know i'm heralded for it you know, See, that's what i love about it though oh. is you don't have people that are like if this isn't pure maruke or like pure aru then i don't want it you know it's like right. it doesn't matter right. what it is it's a green tree python and it's going to be freaking gorgeous yeah, exactly. And and don't get me wrong, I love the lo- pure locality stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, like uh, my friend Gary Schiavino works a lot with Arfax yep. and Manicori, and you know he keeps that stuff pretty pure, and he selectively breeds that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, he takes the best Manicori, to, you know, out of his clutches, and he breeds it to the best Manicoris, and. You know, that's what, what a lot of the carpet python guys do. They selectively breed yeah. those locality types, and they look just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, you've got you've got the two camps in the in the carpet world, which is the purists and then the guys that are like, uh, you know, kind of like you with the green trees. And, hey, it'll, it'll look cool. I'm going to make it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's a lot more flexibility in, in the green tree mm-hmm. community about, you know, crossing out different locality types. Well, that's just, it's become sort of the thing across the board, not just with carpets or anything else, you know, with locality, anything, especially, you know, gray bands are the same way. Like gray band guys are so hardcore about their localities and making sure that, right. you know, those county lines don't get mixed up. And I don't know, it's, it's like, I understand it to a degree, but there's some stuff where it's just not really necessary. You know, it's like people take, I understand it. People it. take it a little too I understand far. it completely. Yeah, I mean, I understand it completely. Um, I just like flexibility. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, just be flexible. And not getting the angry and, mob coming after you when you post pictures of it? Yeah, and, and put your soapbox away. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you what do you currently have as far as current projects going right now? Like, what's your, uh, you got anything planned this year? Well, I'm still kind of in the middle of, of my um, my breeding season, mm-hmm. and I'm such a regimented ball python seasonal breeder. I mean, I've got a, you know, really a pretty regimented breeding season with my ball pythons, but my chondros are all over the place. 
And so I'm, I mean, I'm almost always pairing or attempting to pair animals. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a uh, clutch in the incubator right now that's due to hatch uh, the first week of April. And this, this could be a really cool clutch. This is a Ye- Ye- Jaeger who yep. is the sire of sick of the sickness was paired to a Matt Morris high yellow female. And um, I've got 13 eggs in the incubator that are just a few weeks away now from hatching. And uh, that should be cool because um, Jaeger was a red baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has thrown a lot of high yellow and a, a lot of melanistic animals like the sickness. And then, of course, Matt Morris's animal was a, a yellow baby and She's about 50% yellow and 50% green. So there, there's no telling what's going to be in there. I think it's going to be a, you know, a, a, a pretty equally red versus yellow baby clutch. And mm-hmm. I have no idea what any of those things are going to turn into. So that's, that's going to be a cool one. And then of course um, I posted today, my blue Cyclops girl is due to lay any day. I pulled her purchase. Yep, I saw that. Yeah, and her the sire to her is the sickness, Ooh. and uh, to me that's that's the pinnacle of of any breeding project that I could ever imagine. Mm-hmm. Never in my wildest years, you know, when I started keeping these things, could I have imagined that I could have a, a pairing like that. And so uh, that's just you know, man, fingers crossed, and I'm just I'm nervous about her every day. I, I check yeah. on her multiple times. <laughs> She looks perfect, mm-hmm. and she's doing all the right things at the right time. And so, um, hopefully, I'll, I'll have some eggs in the next in the next few days um, from her. She laid 18 eggs last time I bred her, and so I'd like to see a, you know, something up there about the you know same 15, mm-hmm. 16 eggs. That would be great. Um, and then I've got another uh, pair that's breeding right now, and and I mentioned this. On our show, I don't know if you listened to our last show, but um, I did. It's an it's an Aru type male to a very nondescript yellow uh, captive bred female, mm. and I'm super excited about that because you know those those will be entry level chondros. Yeah, if yeah. This is gonna happens. be like the first first year you've kind of pop you know produced some that are in that sort of vein, right? Um, you know, I pr- my very first clutch that I produced about six or seven years ago was an Aru to an Aru. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't get very many eggs. I think I got seven or eight eggs. In fact, Eric Burke uh, got one of those babies. I remember it because he took just an incredible picture of it. I think it, it, won, it won some kind of deal on a Chondro calendar or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, that's been really... I guess what I would consider an entry level green tree clutch yeah. uh, was. So I'm I'm super excited about that because you probably know I'm I'm planning on you know vending a lot of shows now that yeah, I've, now that I've retired this, from medicine. Got all this time to do whatever you want. Got a lot more time, and so vending shows is on my schedule, and I would love to have you know a nice hearty batch of mm-hmm. of baby green trees to take up there and introduce people to them. It'll just be, it'll be nice to see a vendor with captive bred condors. Cause you don't see that at shows. I mean, I'm telling you, I haven't vended a lot of shows. Um, but the ones that I've attended so, so few. I mean, I, I, I there's just a, I, I can just think of the number on one hand, mm-hmm. you know, where I'll go to a show and there'll be legitimate, you know, U.S. captive bred uh, chondros. It's kind of depressing. You know, I mean, it is. And, and I've talked with Buddy a lot about this. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, some of it's just market forces. Like, in other words, people don't that have them don't need to go and spend the weekend and buy the yeah, booth yeah you know to, to, to sell them um, that's not my motivation though my motivation is to introduce people to, to, to captive bred chondros and to kind of dispel um, a lot of the myths about them that's why we started our show mm-hmm. was to dispel myths about chondros but 
you know, the bottom line is, and I think it's only going to get, I don't know if better or worse is the right word. Um, I think they're going to become as I think the imported animals and I hope we get a chance to, to talk about because you and uh, Evan did a really nice job about talking about the difference between imported mm-hmm. farm bread and U.S. captive bred condros. Um, I think that that market, the imported or the farm bread, is um, has the potential to kind of dry up for a couple different reasons. Right. It's so, yeah, it, and you know, like we said in the last episode, like we're, I'm not against imports at all. Like they have their place, you know. Especially like you talk to the Poplin carpet guys, you know, that's they get new blood from that kind of stuff. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. the Australian stuff where we're stuck with what we got. Um, right. It's just you know that like I said, there's there's a place for them, and I think that place is not for the people that are not ready to commit to something that's probably gonna not work in their favor. Yeah, unfortunately, the majority of those animals go to people that shouldn't have them. Um, you know, you, you guys did a good job touching on the fact that there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to get an imported mm-hmm. animal, especially if it's your first one. And to go through legitimate sources like Ryan Burke and Harlan, who, you know, they bring the animal in, they reestablish yeah, it. Yeah, they, they take the time it. to get it on the up and up, yeah. They do, you know, they take the time and, you know, that's the way to go. If you're going to get an imported animal, um, I do have one, one thing that you guys didn't mention. Um, I do have a difference in opinion about getting an imported animal because several years ago we had Daniel Natouche on our show. Are you familiar with that name? Yep. Yep. I listened to that episode. Okay. Well, you know, He's like the preeminent field researcher on green trees in the wild, right? right I mean, right. He, he's literally out there in the field. And he thinks and makes a compelling argument that um, the condor population in the wild is decreasing because of both deforestation and overcollection. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we have to consider that as, as hobbyists. You know, nobody wants to decimate the species in Indo, right? Right. I mean, you know, we, we don't want that to happen. And I think, you know, between that, I think the, uh, uh, you know, that the Indo government is cracking down a little bit on mm-hmm. the exportation because, it, you know, it's illegal to export a wild-caught chondro. Right. They have their little and loopholes that they use to, to get around. They do, and it's the yeah. farms. It's the, right, it's the... Uh, it's the Indonesian farms that produce babies and they can Im- export uh, those babies. And, you know, the majority of babies exported out of Indonesia are not farm bred babies. They're just labeled as such. Mm-hmm. But the, the farm bred production in Indonesia is, has dropped. And that's probably has a lot to do with the passing of the Bushmaster. Yeah. Uh, Vlad. Genius. Vladimir. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the guy was a chondro genius and, uh, they produced a lot of incredibly farm-bred animals out of Indo, but he's passed for several years now, and, mm-hmm. and so the farm production, I think, is is down from that. So I think we're getting into an area where in the next few years, you know, the imported animals are going to be they're going to be tougher to come by, mm-hmm. and so I, I'm I'm just super happy when I see a lot a lot of people in the United States like your, yourself and and you know, that are producing these things in captivity because that's what we really need to, mm-hmm. you know, to, to, to continue to, to grow our hobby. Yeah, and I'm torn on the Natouche thing because, granted, I've never been to Papua New Guinea. I haven't been to any of the islands. I haven't even been in that hemis- like that that part of the globe. I went to the Bahamas. That's the extent of my traveling. <clears throat> so we have, <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have him say, like, hey, these things, like that well is drying up and it's it's – partially our fault if not a good chunk of it but then you have other guys say i've been there those things are not that difficult to find you know it it, and so i don't know like i said i can't really i don't really have much of a dog in that fight because i've never been there i haven't seen it firsthand but i hear conflicting reports and it's like well do i take everyone what everyone says with a grain of salt or do i you know agree like and not seeing the farms or anything either 
and how those operate. Yeah. You know, it's I don't really know who to believe. I'm sure I I can't imagine with the amount of imported chondros you see on the market that that long term wouldn't have some sort of effect on it. Because you think about how long they've been importing these things and how many just how many come into the country each year as a result of that. You know, there's 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 no way that doesn't have some sort of a doesn't make a dent in some way. I would think so, too. Uh, but I'm in, in a very similar situation as you um, not been over there. Haven't seen eyes on. Um, but I have read accounts um there's an old book called adventures in green tree python country i think or something like that Mm -hmm. and it describes this guy who goes over there and he spent weeks looking for a green tree and like found one you know across the road that was dead you know in in a in a very long time period and you know i don't know i just don't think it's like you go out there at night and they're just falling off the trees out there i really don't think that's that's the case i think Obviously, the natives that are collecting them have a big time advantage over some hobbyists that's going over there and trying to look mm-hmm. for them. Um, but I, my my gut just tells me is they're just not falling off the trees out there. Yeah. Well, I guess the other side of that coin is too is like if they were becoming that hard to find, they wouldn't be importing them in the numbers they did or they do. Yeah. So I don't I don't know. Like I said, I don't know who to believe. Both seem to make sense, but if I was told one or the other, you know, someone actually said, oh, yeah, I've been there, you know, this is actually what I found, I'd, I'd believe it. I'd be like, yeah, probably. If they said they were disappearing or if they said, no, those things are everywhere, I'd be like, okay, sure. And they, you know, just Well, one thing we know for sure is that market forces will ultimately decide the fate of the imported chondro. Yeah. You know, I mean, if people can't import them and make money on them, they're going to stop importing them. Right. So, you know, let's let's just see. I, you know, let's just see what happens to the price. Can can they maintain availability at two hundred and fifty dollars an animal? Mm-hmm. That's something I think about a lot too, especially with you know not just green trees, but like popwin carpets and all the other stuff that gets brought in from that that part of the world. You know, if they close that those borders tomorrow, how serious would things then get? You know, what would the would the price of pop ones skyrocket? Would the price of chondros go even higher? You know, it's it's it'd be like a like an Australia situation where all of a sudden, well, the supplies cut exactly. off, and it's like, what do we do? Exactly, and if you look at the price of green trees in Australia, it's you know, it's multiples of the of the price of green trees in the United States. No, oh, is it really? Oh yeah. I don't know. Like yeah, I they said, would I'm they not... would love they they would love to be able to, you know, spend two hundred and fifty US dollars and, and <laughs> be able to get a green tree there. <laughs> you know what's funny too, like they talk about how there's not supposed to be any imported stuff over there in Australia, but you see pictures of some of these chondros and you're like, that's not a Northern Territory chondro. Like that's that's definitely yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, speaking of Australia, tell me, uh, tell, me tell, tell me a, sec- a second about your clutch uh, that you got in the incubator. Uh, it was a Bioc type female to a Bioc type male. Uh, she gave me seventeen eggs. One of them, seventeen eggs and a slug. Very and cool. It looks like all of them are all of them are doing good. I'm only I'm about twenty one days out from hatch day. Okay, so you're real close. I mean, you're close to me. Yeah, it was. I, th- I think our clutches were within a, a day or two of each other. Like I posted mine, or you posted yours, and then the others dropped too. So we may have babies on the same day. I don't know. That'd be cool. Well, this is my first clutch. You, it's nerve wracking as hell. You remind me a lot of. Do you know Thomas O'Kane? Yeah. In Texas, you know Thomas. Mm-hmm. I'm friends with him yeah, on Facebook. Yeah. I don't talk to him a ton. I asked him about an incubator when I was first getting mine together. Okay. I'm asking him how he set his up, but Yeah. His his your story reminds me a lot of his. His very first clutch was last year and it was uh Biak to Biak. And um I ended up getting some of those babies from him. I got four of those babies. We did a trade deal with some mm-hmm. of my um uh, some of the uh repeat sickness babies and so i ended up getting four of of um 
of his, and they were just a, a pleasure to work with. I ended up selling them all. That's why I wanted to get them. I wanted to have some entry level Condros when yeah. I've been to shows. And um, it was kind of an interesting, I don't know if you saw his post about um, how all of his babies were so docile. Did you, did you see no, that? No, but I did see, I mean, I've seen a lot of pictures of him handling them without blood being yeah. all over his hands. <laughs> right. And we, we had kind of an in, interesting conversation about he attributed, and he kind of was saying it almost sheepishly, like, you know, because of, a lot of people think you shouldn't handle baby chondros because of the risk of tail kink. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, we, we had a debate um, on his post about these things were docile because he handled them when they were relatively young. And the other side of the argument was, well, they're docile because they're, they're captive bred right. and they're not plucked out of the wild, you know? And so we had a real nice, uh, civil conversation about that. Um, but I'll just say from the four animals that I had by the time, you know, when I got them, I handled them a lot and they were just puppy dog tame. Hmm. Well, if these are going to be anything like the dad, then we're all in trouble. <laughs> Well, Thomas will tell you that his, his adults, yeah, his adults were not real handable either. Yeah, the female's not too bad. Like the female, once I get her out, she's fine. Like I'm, I'm she's fairly trustworthy. But that male, he'll light me up <laughs> any chance he gets. He's gonna take it. If it moves, he, it's it's getting murdered. <clears throat> and he hits hard too. It's not like these little like half-assed you know Treboa strikes. It's like full on. Like I'm taking your I'm taking to, your hand with me, yeah. He will donate his teeth to the cause. Yes, he will. <clears throat> but I don't I don't know. He was my first because my I I explained the last episode like my first Condro experience was uh, what year is it? Two it was 2019. It was some years ago that I got my first Condro and that ended horribly. <laughs> like so many other people. <clears throat> so this male I got in 2017, because it'll be two years this year since I got him. Uh, and I got him in a trade. And he was in really, he was being kept like a, the, the guy that had him before me was an absolute moron. And he was keeping him all wrong, <laughs> you know. And I traded a pair of caramel carpets that I had for him. <clears throat> and uh, he had an RI, you know, not long after I got him. If he, he probably he already had it actually when I got him. I'd, I'd imagine it was pretty pretty rough when he you know the way they were keeping him. But um, so I got him fixed up, <clears throat> and I don't he's he's definitely got Biak in him. I wouldn't be surprised if there was something else. But you know you know how that goes. You know if if you don't of course. have lineage, then it's anybody's guess. But I don't know. I'm 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 planning on pairing him to my other female later this year. Um, so hopefully that that'll take two. He's he did really well with this female. He was all over her. He wasted no time. Yeah, that's um that in my experience that is tends to be the case. I mean, if they're going to lock up, it's within like 30 minutes of introduction. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they and I don't know if it's a guy thing or a girl thing or or both. Um I think it's both, you know, both have to be ready. But yeah, most of the time it happens very quick. But when you get babies, though, what what determines you? What determines a holdback for you? Like what makes you? What makes you determine who stays and who goes? Yeah, that's that's tough. I mean, and it depends on a lot of things. Um, it depends on you know who the parents were. Um, it depends on how the babies look. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about babies, I, I have more experience or really almost universal experience with, with red dominant clutches. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I'm looking for the darkest of the dark and the least patterned baby is what, um, you know, I'm looking for a hold back and that, Certainly that was the case with the sickness. He was, mm -hmm. of, of his clutch, he was the only one that turned out as melanistic as he was. Um, 
but he was noticeably different. I mean, it's one of those things you just kind of, you just look at and you go, wow, that one's, that one's really different. Um, the yellows, I have very little, I've never held a yellow baby back. I, I haven't produced that many. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that'll change this year with this clutch that's getting ready to hatch. I will definitely hold some yellows back from that clutch. Um, but again, you know, like the, the blue girl and, and the sickness, I won't, I'll hold all of them back. Yeah. Every one um, until they start to change. That's kind of where I'm at with this clutch is that originally my plan was, okay, I'm going to hold on to everything that hatches for a minimum of a year and then decide who stays and who goes. Which is it like, I don't mind doing that, but then I also think about it. Like I could just pick half the clutch that I want to keep now and sell the other half and then, you know, roll that money back into caging for some of the other stuff that I have growing out. Uh, just other basic upkeep kind of stuff. So I don't like, what's your, what's your take on that? Do you, do you, does it, again, does it depend on the, the parents and the clutch as far as determining if you, you keep some, uh, a clutch or a half a clutch or send them off? You know, this this clutch with the Cyclop and the Sickness will be the first clutch that I will literally keep every baby. Mm-hmm. All the other clutches I've done, pretty much what you described, um, I have picked out, um, you know, I would say if I just had to guess, 25% of the animal's that I designate holdback yeah. and I sell the rest. And of the 25% I keep as they undergo their change, I sell half of that, oh, you know? Okay. So I'm left with, you know, I'm left with just a handful of holdbacks from each clutch, but I'll tell you this, I've used, I've used the money from that to be able to do stuff like, like purchase that blue Cyclops girl, mm-hmm. you know, that is, that is now going to give me the clutch of my life. Ho- hopefully you know, if things work out. Um, so I, I, you know, I think there's advantages and disadvantages to be completely honest with a, a Biak locality type to a Biak locality type. You pretty much know what you're going to get. Yeah. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not there, expecting, a, uh, any, anything, you know, spectacular or, or well, no, or, I mean, they're, they're shatteringly different. But, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you're not going to pop a sickness out, you know, so if it were me doing that and I did this with my Aru to Aru clutch, mm-hmm. I sold I sold the majority of them and I used the money to fund you know other projects or cages or or whatever. Yeah. Well, it's tough and I was talking to somebody recently too and you came up and I oh, I don't remember who it was. I'm trying to think and I I can't remember but uh, cause we were talking about the whole, like, man, what if I end up selling a bunch and then, you know, one gets <laughs> sent off and it ends up being like something special yeah. and they yeah. said, well, Bill, does, you know, Bill sells them and he doesn't really worry about it because if that thing come, you know, raises up and turns out to be something spectacular, then people are going to be like, man, who produced that and where'd, where'd it come from? And they're going to be like, well, it came from Bill Stiegel. And so it's almost the best form of advertising in a sense. That's absolutely right. And I've done that. Um, I did that with, uh, not the last clutch, but the second to last clutch I produced, the blue Cyclops girl, um, you know, I held back my six, six, eight animals. And I, I sold, I don't know, I guess 10 or 12. And sure enough, I mean, I, I think I like did like an inverse holdback almost, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. like every single one that I sold is, is turning out better than the ones I kept. Um, but I don't really... I mean, I'm not beating myself up over it because it's exactly like you said. Um, the lineage is out there, and you know, I can always say, "Look, this is what this girl can produce." Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's a calculated risk. But if I would have sold the sickness, I would be, I would be kicking myself. <laughs> but that's the frustrating <laughs> part: is you never know. Like you don't know if that one you're selling is going to be it. You're right. And so it's, I mean, You're that's right. just the, the gamble with Condros period is, you know, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. But, you know. and, and there's some people like my friend Marshall Mendez, you know, I think for the most part, he keeps them all, every clutch mm-hmm. until they're two years old. See, you know, would, I think that would pretty be nice much too, his, but space is, space is not a luxury for all of us. Space and time, my friend, <laughs> space and time. 
Um, so again, it depends, you know, are, are you talking about one clutch, your first clutch? Mm-hmm. Or are you talking about somebody like buddy who produces three to five clutches a year? You know, do you want to hold on to, you know, a hundred plus chondros until they're two years old? Yeah. No, you know, you just, it's, it, it, it makes it really hard, especially when, you know, you're living in the real world. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like I said, my my original plan was hold on to all of them for a minimum of a year, but my original plan with the eggs was to let the female uh, incubate them as well, and I completely bailed on that. So who knows? <laughs> <clears throat> well, you're just flexible. I mean, it's good to be flexible. I man, I I really bitched out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've talked so much shit for weeks. I was like, man, I'm doing MI. I'm not scared, whatever. She loaded those clutch, man. I had that egg box out faster than you could freaking say egg box. Yeah. You know, I mean, you say like a year, but you have to remember to establish a baby chondro, Mm -hmm. you're talking six months minimum. Yeah. And it depends on who you're selling the animal to. If it's their first, if it's their first chondro, Six months and 20 meals may not be enough. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, especially if they're, you know, you're shipping the animal out. If, if it's local, it's one thing. You take it back and or help the person out or whatever. But, man, I'm telling you, a year is like, I mean, that's that's kind of an average for me to, to get an animal established. Yeah. And, and like really feel comfortable about sending it to somebody. I get the better the better phrasing is is I'm taking my time with with selling any. Basic, you know. Yeah. But yeah. how many meals do you prefer to get in the babies before you uh, before you part with them? Well, again, like I said, it depends on the experience of the person that I'm sending them to. Mm-hmm. If it's a first time chondro keeper, I'm talking twenty meals. Okay. And you I know, know and that's. Go ahead. I was going to say, assuming you know that they they you know they hatch, they have their first shed, mm-hmm. and you know maybe it takes me a couple weeks three weeks to get them going and then you know one meal a week for 20 weeks you know you're talking about that's eight that's eight nine months right there Mm -hmm. and when you when yours hatched do you i know sort of one of the things that that i've noticed is kind of getting popular is feed is is people feeding neonates like straight out of the egg almost do you usually wait for them to, to give that first shut up or do you offer something within the first two or three days yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and I've experimented with both. Mm-hmm. Um, I have had a baby. I guess maybe the last two years, I've kind of messed around with offering animals that look interested before they have their first shed. Mm-hmm. I remember la- uh, not last clutch, but the clutch before. I had a baby who scarfed up his uh, uh, pinky before he shed. I mean, he just I took it. He took it. I said, "Man, that's awesome." And then he turned into the worst feeder of the clutch. Oh man! You know, I had to I had to assist feed him, work with him, assist feed, assist feed. He finally turned the corner, kicked in. But I just thought that it was ironic that he, you know, took yeah. it right out, right out of the egg. And then after that, he was done. So I don't know. I'm still torn. I will tell you one thing, Justin. Um, I'm a big believer in chick down right out of the egg. You know, first, not right out of the egg, but if you decide to feed, whether it's before or after the first shed, mm-hmm. I don't even mess around with pinks anymore. They all get chick down scented. Okay. And when you assist feed, are you what are you, are you assist feeding whole pinkies, just heads? Are you doing mouse tails? What do you? I will either do a pinky head or a mouse tail. And I'm more likely to do a mouse tail mm-hmm. uh, than a pinky head. They're so much easier to get down. They're really easy to get down, and I think so much of it is it's not the nutritional content that matters. Yeah. It's the swallowing reflex that they have to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, the n- nutritional content between a, a pink head and a mouse tail oh, is... Oh, the light year's different. They're, they're, yeah, but I just think that if they get that swallowing reflex or instinct down, that's what you're really looking for. Because mm-hmm. I had to, with my my pair of uh, Boiga cyania, I uh, do uh, feed them mouse tails for the first like three months before they finally started eating on their own. Seriously? Oh yeah. 
They're captive bred and wow. everything. And Jordan, like I got them from Jordan Russell, and he he gave me a warning ahead of time. He's like, "You're gonna have to probably force feed these mouse tails when you get them. Like they've been eating pinkies with me, fine, no problem. But I guess they're really shy, and so he sent them to me. And sure enough, neither of them wanted anything to do with a pinky, and so I started doing mouse tails, and I did that until they started eating on their own again. So I got pretty well versed in the uh, assist feeding tails <laughs> game. I mean, yeah, the assist feeding. Especially a chondro and a mouse tail is really pretty easy. I don't even take them off the perch. I just, you know, grab them behind the head mm -hmm. and, you know, lube up that mouse tail with some warm water and stick it in about halfway. I make sure they have to swallow it though. Yeah. You know, I'm not. You know, I make sure there's there's a part that they have they that they they have to swallow. They have to get used to that. And most of the time, they, you know. They do well. It, it just takes some patience and and some experience. You know mm -hmm. that that's the other things. Experience feeding baby chondros is you, you just can't read enough or watch enough videos. You just literally have have to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I was so I was actually lucky on the first chondro clutch that I um, that I produced. It was the Arudu Aru, and I only had like eight babies, but they were big eggs and big babies, and they all just like scarfed up their first meal i was like this chondro shit is easy you know <laughs> this is I'd a breeze been, i've been <clears throat> it's so easy what are these knuckleheads talking about I, you know i've been producing carpet pythons and ball pythons for a long time so i figured i'd you know man i i got this down and then i and then the following year i had my second clutch and <laughs> it was so completely complete opposite. opposite i had a big yeah. complete opposite i had a big clutch that was actually my second clutch was the year that I produced the sickness mm -hmm. and it was a big clutch, 23 babies, 23 eggs, 23 babies came out. And I think the first time I tried to feed three of the 23, eight oh. and I was just devastated and, and it took me, it took me, I, I can't even begin to describe how many hours I spent trying to feed those 23 babies and i ended up losing a lot of them i think i probably lost 10 babies and what, um, how will like over the course of what period of time oh months okay you know months yeah. and i got behind on a few and didn't uh assist feed them early enough and my technique was not not good not you know not honed in mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, that's just the way it's going to be yeah. for a lot of people, um, for most people. But every year after that, it got better. Yeah. And like, you know, the last two or three years, I haven't lost a single baby to not wanting to eat. I've always been able to buy various methods and those methods include shipping them to somebody else. Like I shipped. I shipped five babies to Buddy one year because they were just complete runners, would not even come close to taking a meal from me. I shipped him five or six animals, and the day he got them, he got all but one to eat. <laughs> <laughs> go he figure. Said it wasn't like what's that? I said, go figure. I'm telling you, and he said, listen, it's not like I was doing something extraordinary. I just put them in the tub and I put a pink out there and they ate them. So, you know, I think there's just, I don't know what it is. There's something about transporting them, putting them in a different environment, putting them in a box, sending them across the country that they want to eat. Um, See, it so. was the opposite for me. Cause I got a baby from, well, I got two babies from Luke Myers. I lost one. That was a complete freak accident and it drowned. That's neither here nor there, but the other baby, Oh man, yeah, the one that drowned was the one that was doing flawless. Like, that was the one that was eating perfectly, never had an issue, like, rocking and rolling. The other baby that I got from him, which was eating fine with him regularly, it was actually, like, the best feeder of the clutch, <clears throat> or one of them. He sent it to me, and then I couldn't get the damn thing to eat to save my life. Yeah. And, I mean, now it's it's rocking and rolling. I don't have any issues with it. But, man, like, I got a little taste of that, that feeding stuff with babies, and I was like, this is just frustrating. Yeah. I mean, believe me, that happens too. That's the opposite end where you, you know, I'll have an animal that is just eating like gangbusters here and I'll send it out and it won't eat, you know, for the person. And mm -hmm. 
most of the time, well, I won't say most of the time. It's there's been different causes. Um, I sent a baby to somebody out on the East Coast, and they couldn't get it to eat. Couldn't get it to eat. Um, so I said, "Listen, my my friend Gary lives an hour from you. Will you take it to him?" And he's he's willing to take the animal and you know work with it, get it established. Yep. They go sure. So they they drive the hour. They get to Gary, and Gary goes, "Damn, this thing looks hungry." Gary puts it in the tub and feeds it right there in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, what do you do? Just hand it back to him and be like, there you go. I mean, you know, what do you do there? Do you go, you know, and Gary said, I didn't do anything crazy. I just literally warmed it up, put it on tongs and put it in front of its face. I mean, I, I don't know what these people could have been doing, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, for it to not eat. So, you know, you just throw your hands up and you just go chondros, you know? Yeah. And it's, but does it get frustrating as a seller? I mean, you've sold a lot of chondros, but do you have people come to you that are like, hey, the snake I got from you isn't doing such and such. This one's having, you know, problems with, you know, it's not perching right or whatever. And they tell you they're doing everything right and they send you pictures and stuff like that, but you still feel like you're not getting the whole story. <laughs> you know, I mean, surprisingly, I've had very few stories like that. I've had a couple. I can think of maybe one time, one or two times that I've ever had them ship an animal back to me. I reestablished it and shipped them back. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the the very first, the clutch, the very first clutch I produced, the Aru to Aru. I, I sent a guy's very first condor, I sent him an animal, and I never heard back from him. And about a year later, he sent me a picture of it, and he goes, this thing's doing so awesome, it's incredible, I love it sent me a picture of you know in the original tub because i, I made a tub for him mm -hmm. um you know just a super basic tub with yeah. a heat you know the heat in and all that uh, so i sent it to him and he, so he sends me a picture and i look in there and there's no water bowl and i go um this, this thing's a year old and so i say uh what uh where's the water bowl in, in the tub and he goes oh i don't i didn't think condors drank water I just spray. <laughs> I thought they just drank off their coils, so I just I've been spraying them a couple times a week. I was like, "You've got to be kidding me! This thing lived a year, just drinking water off of its coils." Mm -hmm. So I'm like, "Man, put put a water bowl in there, bro." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was shocked. So I was. I was, I was watching and, YouTube a couple nights ago. Well, this is actually a couple weeks ago, but there was a YouTuber on there, and they have like. Something crazy like fifty thousand subscribers or something like that, and they had a video of their their Bioc, and they had all the the typical like misinformation, and it was like, yeah, you don't these don't <laughs> these don't drink out of water bowls. You have to mist them because they drink it off their coils, or they have to have like running water like they're a chameleon or something. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> it killed me, man. Because I was like, you got so many subscribers, and you're telling people these things. I was like, oh my god. And of course, they were keeping it in like an exoterra with the with the heat lamp, and they had the sure in the, the screen top spring loaded and... bamboo perches that were too big, and it was just like, oh my god, like misting machine, right? Had a mister. I don't even know. I was getting so <laughs> irritated at that point, just at the amount of information that was getting spread to that many people that was wrong, and I was just oh it well. Hurt. Well, it's um. You know, I think I mentioned it on our last podcast. The majority of people listening to this show and that listen to our show know better. Yeah. The tricky part comes to informing those that we don't have their platform, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think for me vending reptile shows that are 90% ball pythons and ball python people, that's where I'm going to get that platform, you know. Mm -hmm. It's definitely in a in – a, an industry now where when you go to shows you really don't see a ton of diversity to see a table with with baby green trees and even adult green trees you know captive yeah. bred like in its entirety like it's not just one or two you know imported animals that are just at the end of the table with you know a sea of other stuff like that that kind of stuff is going to stand out and i think that's going to get people asking questions yeah absolutely i mean and i can tell you just from the last show that i've ended um, you know, I do ball pythons. It is, uh, percentage wise, the, by far the vast majority of animals I produce are ball pythons. That's mm -hmm. what I have at my table, but I brought six captive bred green trees up there 
and the traffic that that generated, you know, was was insane. And did you have a lot of people that were asking, like, what, like, they had never seen one before? Like, what, you know, what was it? Like, what species was it? Or did they know it was a green tree and they were asking sort of the the general questions most, you sort of most, expect? Most people, most people that confronted me or were interested in with them knew what they were. What they didn't, what freaked them out is when I unlocked the display cage and just grabbed it and pulled it out. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what freaked them out. You know that that it wasn't just biting my hand continuously. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what freaked them out. I I I'm so torn on that misconception too, because like I do understand there's always exceptions to stuff. Like I understand there are biox out there that you can handle and not get lit up. But then I go into my male's tub to do anything, <laughs> and I'm like, you fit the stereotype. Like you're the reason why people think you're the devil. <laughs> exactly, and. You know, it's a, it's it's a different animal. Those, you know, first of all, BX, I think even most people tell you, even a lot of the captive bred ones are a a bit more defensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but an imported BX compared to a uh, a non BX U.S. captive bred animal, they're they're like it's like the difference between a domestic dog and an African dog. Yeah, you know, wild African dog. That that's the difference. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've got upwards of 40 chondros. I can pick every single one of them up and handle them. Every one, 40 out of 40, and not worry about getting lit up. Hmm. Must be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one girl that I well, got. She's the most recent one I got is a, a female. I When I was getting out of Crested's, I traded the last of my breeders for her. But she was sold as an Aru. Um, I don't think she's pure Aru. Just a hunch, once again. Who knows for sure. Uh, but she's pretty mellow. Like, I can go in there and, and pull her out usually. If I put, if I take the purge out first and then take her off of it, it's fine. Because any other yeah. time she thinks she's getting food. And her food response is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but she's completely trustworthy, which is nice. I'm not I'm not used to that. I'm yeah, used and to, I'm, used you know, I'm not a mouth. big handler. Yeah, I'm not I'm either. not a big handler. Of my animals, um, ma- mine mainly be- just because of the size of, of my collection. Um, I actually think it's the ones that don't get stressed by it, mm. and you know when they're stressed, right? When they're yeah. trying to bite your face off or whatever. Mm. I think it's actually good for some um, handling uh, these animals. They're so sedentary, man. You, you know that. They're so lazy. Yep. I think getting them out and getting them a little bit of exercise is good for them. And especially the ones that tend to retain stool, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think it's I think it's great. And when people want to, you know, come over to my place and they want to see a condor, I always, if they're interested and and are up for it, I always want them to handle one because there's nothing like it. There's not another animal out there, at least that I work with, carpet balls, uh, Borneos, rhinos, rough scales. Mm-hmm. There's nothing like holding a chondro and being able to just look it in the eye you know oh, i forget you have rhino rat snakes yeah i've got a pair oh man they come from terry they're cool uh no they didn't um terry's a good friend of mine here in texas but they did not come from him i actually picked them up in, uh at uh, tinley park uh probably four years ago and i cannot remember the source uh that they came from Oh man, I want some so bad. You got those, and you got the rough scales, man. So jealous. Oh man, and the Jake rough want, scales. Me are... and Jake want rough scales so bad. Oh god, they're just incredible. I, I saw, I saw my very first rough scale when I went to Northeast Carpet Fest, and uh, Owen McIntyre had one. I'd seen pictures of them. I were, fam- I was familiar with them. Mm-hmm. They are so different in person. I mean, totally a picture does absolutely nothing for a rough scale python you got to see it in person got to hold it that was one of the things with julander's book that i was that what i found probably the most interesting out of of course all the other awesome info that was in that book but the the rough scales are genetically like the closest relatives to green trees out of the other you know morelia yeah i mean that's 
totally crazy. Which, if you look they, at them, it makes sense because they do have like the bigger eyes and they do have sort of the the very similar head structure and and stuff like that. But to have an animal that occupies almost a well, not even almost, but a completely different habitat and look completely different. Yeah, and and they act so <laughs> carpet like. Mine act just like my carpets. Mm-hmm. They, in other words, they won't perch. They they love a shelf. Yeah, you know. They love the basket. They love a shelf, just like carpets do. But um, they rarely perch. They, they don't act anything at all like a green tree. And are you pretty like mellow? Python. Oh, totally chill. Because for some reason, I remember years ago reading like, oh, rough scales are they're they're pretty nasty. Like they're you know they're like tree boas. They're just constantly going for you. But then I hear from a lot of people that keep them now. They're like, these are probably the most mellow carpets I have. Yeah, I. Uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't know. Everything that I've heard um, in the research I did before I acquired mine were that they were mellow, mm-hmm. really mellow, because they've got big freaking teeth. Yeah, they do. They've got uh, <laughs> they've got emerald it's ridiculous. Teeth. Yeah, <laughs> things are crazy. <clears throat> big teeth. And how many so, of those do you um, have? I've got a trio. I've got one. Oh man! Two. When are you going to be producing some of those? Well, hope. It should have be this year, but I can't get I can't get them to lock. Hmm. Um, I've, they're they're four they're either four or five years old now, so they should be. But and they're definitely male and female. I've sexed them multiple times, <laughs> but uh, I've got I've got no locks. And so there's a, a guy in in here in Texas. I just talked to him at the NARBC. His name's Brett Bender. And he thought he had a trio, but he actually has 2.1. Um, um, and so I think he's going to send a male up here um, and see if we can order something out with these two females. I mean, you wouldn't have to cool them crazy low like you would brettles, right? No, no. Oh. These, these, you know, according to people I've talked to, these are relatively easy to breed. Um, you breed them like carpet pythons. And have you, do you keep or have you kept any brettles? Never have. Oh, man. I'm a brettles nut. Phenomenal. Brettles are so Phenomenal cool. animals. They are. They are awesome. You know Austin Warwick, right? Yep. We had him on THP pretty early on, actually, in the in the okay. The timeline. Austin's a, Austin's a great guy. I, you know, I consider him a good friend. Um, and he's got... He, he produces some incredible brettles. Mm-hmm. They're just. I was just talking to Justin Wilbanks about them actually before I came on. Uh, I was like, man, they're like the perfect python. Like you get them too cold, they like it. You get them too hot, they don't care. Like you feed them <laughs> as much as you want, they probably love it. Like they're just. You, I told him, if you kill a brettles, you were really trying to do it. You were trying. Yeah. So those things are tanks, man. Super hardy, super colorful. I mean, it, if you had to ask me, probably be my next venture. Mm-hmm. They're awesome. They're they're really really mellow too, for the most part. I mean, like we like we've talked about in the on THP, like Jacob's female, she's borderline psychotic. But every single one of mine, I can reach in that tub and pick them like pick them up, no problem. Don't have to worry about them grabbing me or anything like that, or thinking they're getting fed. They're just they're so mellow and they're so chill. Yeah, and they're always but, out. Like they're all, like, if you keep them in a you know a tank or something where you can see them, if you come in the room, they come right on out. You know, like most carpets do, and they're just they're they're always visible. They're not, you know, in a hide twenty four seven. They're just they're always there. Yeah, I mean that's the way the rub scales are too. They're very inquisitive animals, mm-hmm. um, and when they when they get that look, it's like you said, it's not because they're just interested in eating. You know, they just want to see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to move. We're going to sell our house, downsize our house, and um, I need a bigger snake facility. So when I do that, um, brettles will definitely be on my radar. Either Yeah, I mean, either Austin or Casey Cannon are the, are the guys to hit up for those. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, that's, I think that's right. Me and, Jake just to, got uh, a, me and Jake just got a stone wash and a head female did you really from casey yeah and they're wow. they're flawless they're i just fed them today for the first time since they came in and they both pounded food no problem so 
Are they babies? Uh, the male is a 2017. The female is a 2018. Yeah. Yeah, those are really, really cool. And this, the male's a low expression stone wash, but he's still, he's going to look so good as an adult. Like, it's so interesting compared to the, you know, the other two. Well, actually, I have, we got this pair, and then me and Jacob have sold the other pair. Those will get shipped off within the next week or two. Uh, but compared to the normals, quote unquote normals, that, like, the colors are so faded on him, and everything's just so, like, muted. It's really like it doesn't have the bold blacks that that my you know my female does, and it's they're really it's just interesting. And I like the fact that they don't have a ton of morphs. You know, you only have your handful of of brettles. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like what what else? Naturally, is there they're just gorgeous stonewall. animals. Yeah. They have hypos and they have the stripes, but that's about it. Cool stuff. But getting back into chondros do you what when you pair yours do you pair yours just kind of year round or do you have a do you do any sort of cycling i do a cycling I, i'll do a, a you know just kind of a natural winter cycling here in texas and i'll start that in depends what you know what what our temperatures are doing but it's not uncommon for me to start dropping temps um november december Mm-hmm. And I'll just drop the nighttime temps. I, I leave the I leave the daytime temps kind of where they are, and I just drop nighttime temps. Um, and I'll you know not a not a drastic drop, you know just five degree drop, and and that can go on for three four months. Um, but I am just you know I'll see more activity during that time, but I'll also see breeding activity in the spring. Mm-hmm. You know, when after I've after I've raised my temps back up a little bit, uh, they seem to really, at least the animals that I work with here, and you know, in my conditions, they don't seem to have a rhyme or reason. Uh, so I just keep pairing them up. You know, I'll I'll give them a month break if they don't do anything, then I'll pair them up. Uh, you know, another month. And mm-hmm. If they don't do anything, I'll pair them up a month later. Usually, if they're going to breed, like we talked about, they take very quickly. Yeah. Um, and they will, you know, they'll be on, they'll be off maybe the next night and then back on again, and then they'll be off and then they'll be back on. I mean, you know, when they've got their, when they've got their thing going on, um, if you put an animal in and he he hasn't paired up with a female in a day or two, I, I, I'm pretty much said, well, they're just not ready right now. And take them out in the rest of a month and have you had any males that are because you hear a lot of guys talk about males that are really good breeders and then you hear guys talk about males that are you know horrible breeders and don't want to do anything or don't seem to know what they're doing do you, yeah. have, you have you experienced that in any of your stuff yeah yeah i've experienced <clears throat> all of it um i mean i've experienced i've got a five-year-old male that has shown interest in no females even if they're proven breeders um i've got jaeger who's you know, he's just a man. He's he's a, he's a great breeder. He's you know produced a couple different females, but I will introduce him with yet another female, and they never lock. <laughs> so I don't you know is it her? Is it him? No idea. Right. No idea. So they're just they're they tend to be a little bit more finicky. Um, and you just can control what you can control, but ultimately they're going to have the last say. So what is your advice to people who want to get into green trees? Because you are a guy that a lot of people go to. You have a lot of people send people to you. If, um, if you have someone coming in to green trees, what would be like the five things you'd tell them? Well, I don't think it's too much different than anybody getting their first blank, whether it's ball python, boa, green tree, you know, do a little research. Um, these animals are not impulse buys. You have to have a certain level of book knowledge, so to speak. Um, so do your research. Get associated with um, a breeder that has a good reputation and if possible, that's somewhat local to you, you know, the ability, what I love, and, and a lot of people shy away from having strangers into their facility for some reason. I'm not sure mm-hmm. why, 
I'm the opposite. I love for people to come over. If anybody is even considering getting a green tree from me, especially if it's their first one and they're local, I insist they come over um, and see how I keep either that particular animal or baby, sub-adults, adults, adult, you know, whatever they may be interested in. So try to align yourself with, you know, somebody in, that, that has some experience. And, um, and that's not hard these days. It's You do a little due diligence and you know who – the reputable people in the industry are, mm -hmm. you know, there's no excuse. There's no excuse for not doing that. Um, I would not, and I have been put in the situation of selling a very high end animal, a very expensive green tree to a, to first, uh, first time keepers because they have the money and I won't do it. I think you should break your teeth on a entry level green tree. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, you know, I would, I would not spend the bank on your first green tree, but I would get a U.S. captive bred animal as your first green tree for sure. Not only for the animal, but the support you're going to get from the breeder. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that about the, you know, not dropping a ton of money on your first green tree because. Like Bill Hughes, who breeds uh, emeralds, as I'm sure you know. Uh, yep. He seemed he it from what I've talked to him, which hasn't been a ton, but he he seems to vet a good bit of the people that are gonna spend you know money on his captive bred emeralds. Of course. And it makes sense if you think about it, cause. You have some Joe Schmo who comes kind of out of nowhere on Facebook and says, hey, man, I'm going to send you, you know, two grand to buy these, you know, these emeralds or whatever. And if you just say OK and then send them the animals, you know, and they end up not knowing what they're doing and those die like now they're out two grand and now you're a bad guy because you sold them animals. You know, it, when you're dealing with with numbers like that, I think it would be. I completely who are you to not you know kind of vet who you're who you're sending them to i mean i i couldn't have said it better it's the, exactly the same reason that i i established these things for months um i vet the people buying them because if i send an animal out and it doesn't establish well and it ends up dying i pay for that mm -hmm. i cut co i cover it either in another animal or or I give the money back. So, yeah, you you know, you need to pretty much prove to me that if an animal gets there and it doesn't do well, it's an animal issue and it's not a you issue. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it, why would I do, you know, I want to maintain, you know, my high customer service rating, but I could sell the animal to somebody else easily. Mm -hmm. You know, these are high demand animals. So, yeah, I mean, I, I see that big time, and I, and I do the same thing. It's, I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't blame them one bit. I mean, because, like I said, when someone comes back and says, hey, I spent two grand on, you know, this emerald and it died, then all of a sudden, you know, you're the asshole because you sold them an animal that expensive and it was, you know, DOA or, you know, was screwed before it even got to the house or so they claim and right right I, yeah you I know just i've just forego been, that um, headache <laughs> yeah i you know i've just been i don't know if lucky is the right word but uh, i just have not had that experience because i i do the same thing especially if they're not local mm -hmm. i'll roll the dice a little bit on a local animal because i know that i can always get it back yeah um when they, when you ship them out, then, you know, you have no control over, you know, the people I think are much less likely to hit you up and say, Hey, listen, I'm having trouble. You know, uh, this, this, this thing hasn't eaten for me or it had a bad shed or, you know, when they're local though, I can always get the animal back or I can go to the person's place right. and, and see firsthand, you know, their husbandry. I don't mind doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but when you ship it out, man, all bets are off. 
And going back to your Neos, because I was just thinking about this a minute ago, because I'm curious. With your hatch, like your your fresh, fresh neonates, do you still keep yours over water? Yeah, absolutely. They uh, they get pure uh, water as their substrate um, in a shoebox type uh, size tub mm-hmm. with a single perch. Um, and when I say water as a substrate, it's a sliver of water. Yeah. I mean, it is. There might even be a little bare patch or two in the tub with it you know, is plastic. Certainly nothing that if they got in there that they could drown themselves. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's worked uh, really well for me uh, to establish them until they get their first few meals in. And then I'll go to paper towel and a, and a water dish. Um, but I think hydration is so key in those animals. And just a couple of days or a few days without hydration can make an animal turn the corner. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I think just having that water there and you've got to be diligent, you know, you have to, you have to check it every day. And if that water's uh, tainted, then, you know, it's not a big deal to pour it out and put some yeah, fresh water in. So you change you it out to... like every other day, right? Well, it depends because, um, you know, usually when a baby will eat, it will defecate within the next couple of days. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not just shitting continuously, you know, right. I mean, it's, but yeah, you, you know, you've got to be diligent and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of soaking those babies. Like in other words, um, they'll be on the perch and I'll just take that perch, you know, even in those hatchling tubs, I've got them set up removable perches, I'll take that perch and I'll just set it in the water and, and leave them there overnight. Next day, come out, you know, put the perch back in, they perch back up. So I I know they're not going to be dehydrated. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming when they're over water like that, you're you're not misting them. You're just letting them baste it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't I won't routinely mist them. I'll just if I want them if I want to hydrate them, I'll soak them. I'll just put them right in the substrate. Mm-hmm. And you with your adults, do you do that same thing too, or are you like a rain chamber guy? You know, I've I've never uh, I'm familiar with the rain chamber, but no, I've never utilized that. Um, if I have an adult that I think is either uh, holding stool or is dehydrated, or it's not uncommon in the in the Texas winters when we get real dry here for them uh, to have bad sheds, I'll mm-hmm. soak them. I'll just I'll put them in a tub, um, you know, water up half their body, and uh, I'll soak them. And you know, I'm used to soaking animals, and this is such a funny thing because I've been on seen so many ball python things like if you soak your ball python you're just a you know you're a criminal you're not (laughs) (laughs) but but i do soak my ball pythons if they've had a bad shed and i usually will soak a ball python uh maybe like six hours when i soak a chondro if it's had a bad shed or i think it's dehydrated or it needs to poop i'll soak them two days oh wow i'll put them in i'll put them in um a rack system you know so it's got some heat Mm -hmm. it'll you know, the water's not getting right, down right. to 75 degrees, but I'll soak them two days, 48 hours. And that usually does the trick? Yeah, it'll usually, that's usually what I've found, that if, if they've got retained shed, it'll take that long uh, to be able to, you know, work that shed off. Or if I just think they're dehydrated, or if I think they need to take a crap, mm-hmm. um, that's that's what works for me. Because, yeah, I was surprised recently on MVF there was a talk about that whole soaking thing and there were people that were leaving them, you know, a day or just overnight. Uh, and I had one of mine, I think it, my male had a, had a rough shed a couple weeks ago and because uh, I was just doing some some searching on the, uh, on the group and that came up. <clears throat> and so I did that. I, I put them in a, in a tub and I... Uh, left him there. I don't think it was overnight, but it was definitely for a handful of hours, and it came off no problem. And so Jake, with his scrub python, it had some stuck shed on the tail, and I was like, "Oh, soak it." And he's like, "Oh, so just leave it in there for like what half an hour?" I was like, "No, dude, give that thing, you know, <laughs> two hours at least, and it'll come right off." And sure enough, even after an hour, I checked on it, and and it came came right off. <clears throat> 
say, you know, this is like the classic. So many things are different depending on your environment, your animals, your caging, your part of the country. Um, it's just so different. And you have to, one of the gestalts of keeping these animals is being able to read them. Um, mine, it's going to act differently than yours. And mm-hmm. So maybe you soak yours for a couple hours and it takes care of them. Maybe I have to soak mine two days. And the only way you're going to know that is just with experience. Yeah. I'm a big proponent of like experimenting to see what works, but not doing it to the detriment of the animal. Of course. You know, like, so I think because of maybe because of social media or something like people are just so terrified to like go out on a limb and actually try something different to see if it works or not because they're afraid people are going to, you know, absolutely annihilate them through their keyboards. But that's the only way things change. That's the only way we find out what's, you know, what, if something works or not, you know, if rain chambers work or not is you just got to try it. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You have, there has to be a common sense, um, element of that. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, try, try stuff that has worked for other people. You know, you've got to make your own mistakes and you got to learn by your mistakes, but it's a lot better to learn from somebody else's successes or mistakes. Yes. Without a doubt. I talked to, um, I talked to Pedro and I, I'll butcher his last name. He's in uh, Portugal. He's produced the mosaic stuff. Mm-hmm. And he was he was on the show. Um, I think it's been a couple years now, but yeah, that was a while he, back. It's been a while, but he he tried the um, water substrate on one of his clutches, and he did not have good success with that. Um, and I can't remember the specifics. I don't know if he couldn't get the animals to eat or maybe, maybe a couple got our eyes or uh, yeah. I can't remember the specifics, but you know, he decided it wasn't for him and you know, so, so many different ways to, you know, to get successful outcomes. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you find something that's working for you or you find somebody that's especially in your area and it's working for them, then there's a good chance it's going to work for you. Yeah. Well, that's, I can say, you know, as far as my first, first clutch and, and breeding and stuff goes, that, that is definitely sort of the frustrating part is if you talk to multiple people, you're going to get multiple, mm-hmm. uh, no, methods, yeah, I mean, multiple methods. It's frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating, but it should also be, um, encouraging the fact that these things, and you touched on it, they're not China dolls. You know, yeah. They they they're rigorous animals. If they're healthy uh, from the get go, uh, they're, they're they're rigorous animals. If they're kept in you know decent parameters, you've got some lead way with them, and you know it's just going to take experience for you to figure out works best for you with that animal in your environment. Right, and that's the that's sort of the the thing is like I don't know what works for me yet. And so that's why I'm asking and talking right. to other people is just like until I figure out what I'm seeing results from that work for me, like I don't you I I've kept the pool of people I've been asking questions to pretty to, I've been keeping that pretty small. Yeah. Um well, and I think that's really worked out. It- <laughs> pretty, it's pretty the well. reason that why why you don't buy ten adult chondros as your first you know experience mm-hmm. because you're doomed to failure if you do that. Yeah. If you just said, all right, I'm going to breed chondros. I need uh, I need four adults and I need eight. I need four males and eight females. I'm going to buy twelve adult chondros and I'm going to start breeding these things. You are you are going to fail miserably for many many reasons. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a you know, very firm believer of of taking your time and actually keeping a species for a while before really jumping in deep on them. Yeah, I mean, and it's of not any just species. species. Yeah, yeah, it's not just species; it's individual animals. These things all can have be quirky and have their little things that they like and dislike. And if if you just acquire adults you're not going to know that mm-hmm. and, and 
you know, you, it's, it's really so much better to get them younger. And that way you get experience with the animal, the animal get ex- experience with your environment. And then you're able to really read the animal. And, and, and until you can really read your animal, you're not going to be successful with it, whether it's, you know, and, and the pinnacle of course is producing these animals, right? You know, that's, that's when you really know you've read your animal. That's when you really know, you know, you know a lot about its behavior. Um, and you can't know that by buying it as an adult in most cases. Mm-hmm. And when you first bred yours, who was, who were you talking to as far as people like helping you like kind of walk you through the whole process of it? Yeah, man, I had some great help. I, I, I really did. Um, you know, obviously Buddy was there for me, but probably the person that I talked the most with was Marshall Mendez. And that's because Marshall, like myself, kept green trees and ball pythons in the same room. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really wanted to know what he did, temp- specifically temperature wise. Um, and so he was really instrumental in. And again, I wasn't even thinking about breeding them. I was just thinking about keeping them alive. Yeah. You know, can I keep them alive in my snake room with ball pythons? He said, yeah, you can. I've been doing it for decades. And what part of the country is he in again? He is in Alabama. Oh, okay. Okay. Luke was, Luke Luke Myers was like, dude, you need to get him on there and, you know, have him talk about the albino thing. I was like, he doesn't strike me as a type that really does the the podcast thing very often. I know he's been on y'all show at, at least once. Yeah. yeah, he has. I know. I, I, I think I think he would do your show for sure. I don't know. Like, that kind of stuff's just yeah. nerve-wracking because I'm like, I don't... What do you, you know, uh, like, what do you talk about? You know? <laughs> it's kind of... <laughs> it's a little intimidating, you know? Like, um, Chuck Vogel was yeah. at Carpet Fest and I was like, you know, Luke also texted me. He's like, dude, Chuck's going to be at Carpet Fest. You need to talk to him about coming on the show. And I was like, I don't even know what you, like, what do I say to Chuck Vogel? You know? Like, Chuck would you... be a great guest. <laughs> like... uh, Chuck's very talkative, too, yeah. as you know, if you met him. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can't speak for those people in particular, but the vast majority of people in our community are happy to share their experience mm-hmm. and their, um, information and their knowledge. I mean, you know that, Bob, because you probably every person you've asked has said they'd be willing to come on the show, you know? Yeah. Um, And I mean, I really haven't asked that many people. It's, it's pretty much been sort of like homies and people I've talked to on a semi-regular basis. So slowly working my way into the, the OGs. It's just kind of funny because I'm like, I like, I'm, I have a podcast and I'm like, I'm not a, I'm so far from anywhere near your level of experience with these things, so I don't really know what I'm talking about. But if you want to come on the show and talk it's, about it, uh, and... it's so it's so funny. When I first started keeping green trees, um, the the MVF was a bit, you know that it was still a big deal back then. Mm-hmm. And I was so nervous when I would post there. Like, I mean, I wanted worthy. to make sure my <laughs> like I Wayne's wanted to make World. sure my punctuation was yeah. right. You know, my my information was right and that I was, you know, gracious. Uh, but most of the people, most of the people in our community, and you probably know this by now, if you come in with somewhat of a humbling, um, demeanor yeah. and you're not a know-it-all because you bred boas for 10 years, yeah. um, people are super receptive. Well, that's the thing I try to keep in mind too, is like, these are guys that like snakes just like me. Exactly. You know, it's it's not rocket surgery. <laughs> At the end of the day, we're that keeping we're keeping snakes in boxes. And most of those people actually remember when they were new. You know, yeah, to keeping a new species. I mean, I I certainly do. I, I mean, it hasn't been that long for me. Um, so most people still remember the first green tree they got mm-hmm. and how. Oh, nervous they were about it, you know, and un- un- unnecessarily so. Um, but most people still remember that. Uh, how long was it from the time you got your first one until you you bred for the first time? 
Uh, it was probably four years. Oh, okay. And was it a matter of like you had one and then you came across a, you know, a female or a male and said, well, if I'm going to do it, kind of this is the time? Um, I had purchased some adult animals. Oh, okay. And, uh, and that was after that, you know, I'd been, I'd been keeping, uh, uh, you know, two or three animals for a couple of years. I was, uh, it gained more confidence in the husband, just, you know, keeping the husbandry. And so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to try to breed them. And, um, you know, again, I had a lot of support from the community and, um, you know, it, it went well. I just, uh, and then I was hooked. Yeah, <laughs> kind of like kind of like you're hooked. Yeah, I really think that's the way to go. I mean, you it, and Harlan will tell you the same thing. You know, start out with with younger animals. You know, raise them up. And me and Brahms talked about that too, because I feel like if you raise them up and you really take the time to get them to adult sizes when you breed them, it's so much more rewarding to you know finally get those babies after so many years of waiting and all the time and effort you put into them, you know, instead of just buying a pair and being like, cool, I got babies. Awesome. And then you have the guy that's been working on it for eight years, like David had or six years. Yeah. And that just means a little more, I think. <clears throat> I think the story of, I just bought a pair of adults and did great with Hondros is a pretty, it's a pretty yo low yielding story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I talked on one of the podcasts about like I acquired an adult female ball python one day from a trusted source and I was breeding her the next day, you know, <laughs> adult chondros are not like that. If you do that, you might as well just put her in the freezer. Um, she's not going to do well mm-hmm. if you do that. So I think there is a lot to the fact of, uh, and I have acquired adult females, I wouldn't even contemplate trying to pair them until I had her under my under my belt for a year. I was to say I know a lot of guys um, they they say if you get a new female, you know, give her a year before you do anything with her. Yep. I mean they're just slightly twerky, you know, mm-hmm. they're they're just a little bit different and all I have them to compare to is the other stuff that I keep. Yeah. Um but, uh, and I, I'll tell you the other thing, you know, when you start talking about breeding green trees and Thomas O'Kane did this, you know, the, his very first breeding of snakes were two green trees, which I've never heard before. That was Luke Myers um, too. Luke Myers is first. Seriously? Yep. See, I learned so much about breeding ball pythons for 10 years before I even attempted to breed a green tree Mm -hmm. not only just breeding but you know getting my incubator established and dialed in you know i mean i just learned from 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 producing literally hundreds of ball python clutches i learned so much that i just can't imagine how these guys do it like like luke and thomas that it's their first species to ever breed it just that blows my (laughs) mind Part of me wonders if it's just not realizing like what they're like what you're what you're getting you're signing yourself up for. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I got a pair. I'm just I'm gonna pair them up. It's gonna be awesome. And it's like not knowing how easy it is with so many other species where it requires like no thought or planning. <clears throat> I I know. I just it's all I downhill mean, from there though. Yeah, that that that's exactly right. I mean, I've experienced the highs of the highs and the lows of the lows, mm-hmm. and I've only been doing and I've only been breeding for, you know, six or seven years, uh, and I've experienced it all. Female, you know, they slug out, they slug out, and then they die. You know, they just die. Yeah, I all of it. You know, and you go, and these guys that have done it, you know, for much longer than I have, and they've seen you know, even a lot bigger swings than that. Um, so I don't know these guys that do it. It's their first species is just, it's just mind boggling. My motto with the species period is keep your expectations low, but keep your hopes high. Yes. Yep. That is <laughs> expect nothing. That, that, that sums it up. Um, and it's funny. I talked to, uh, I've got a young guy here that helps me with the chondros named brian phillips and um 
we just continually, and I've taught him this, uh, just talk so pessimistically about, you know, gravid females. Mm-hmm. Like she ovulated, you know, I'll say like, well, she ovulated and he'll say, well, do you think she's going to die tomorrow or the next day? <laughs> you know, <laughs> And we just take it pretty to such morbid. a level of <laughs> we take it to such a level of pessimism because it's exactly what you said. We, you know, you just prepare for the worst yep. and hope for the best. Yep. It's it's much easier to not sort of be let down in a sense when you look at it that way, you know. Because I mean, with these things, if if there's anything we've all learned from keeping chondros for any extended period of time, is that anything can happen. Yeah, anything can happen, you know, I, I, and I say that, but I say that in the context of breeding them. Mm-hmm. I think for the vast majority of them, if you give them the right conditions, um, you get the right animal from the right person that 90% of the time you're going to have an animal that will give you, that will be solid and stable and healthy for decades. Yeah. I mean, I say it from the point of, like, the things you didn't think could possibly happen in an enclosure with a snake, (laughs) they will find a way to do. That's true. That's true. Because, like I said, I lost that baby from Luke, which was a complete freak accident. And then my male, who's named Problem Child for obvious reasons, uh, (laughs) I think, what was I doing with him? I think I was... He was getting nebulized or something, and I had a perch in that tub that I nebulize in, and he was just on the perch, and so I took him out, and I just set I set the whole perch in the cage with him on it, and I was like, okay, he'll climb up there and do his thing. It's like a one-inch perch, I think. <clears throat> and so I, I set it in there, and I closed it, and I left the room, and I came back like 20 minutes later, and he had somehow gotten himself stuck in the damn PVC pipe, and I had to... And he like wedged in there, like not even like, oh hey, his you know we can just pull him out. Like I had to get my roommate, who's a vet, to come in and help me <laughs> dislodge him from this freaking PVC pipe. And I'm like, you, it's it's I, it's one of those two foot cube cages. I'm like, you had all this space to go, and you found the one inch hole to get yourself stuck in. I was like, what the hell? And so there's like that. Have you ever? And it. That, have you ever seen? Okay, I mean, you want to talk about horror stories. Have you ever seen one that tried to perch on the the cord of either the heat panel or if you have a light in there, the electric cord, they will pry that thing from the wall and try to use it as a perch? Have you ever seen that? No, I've seen my when I kept my pair together when I was pairing them, they would be climbing on that cord that goes to the uh, heat panel on a pretty regular basis, but they never perched on it. I've seen, I've seen them pull it away from the wall enough where they could get their head around it and try to use it as a perch, like where they would almost try to be strangling themselves. Jeez. I've also seen them, you know, and, and Marshall Mendez took pictures and told this story of an animal that he was feeding, and I don't think he uses paper towels as a substrate anymore, but it missed the prey and it struck yep. the paper towel. I had that happen with one of my babies. You have. Yep. And it ate, and a, it, ate it a damn piece paper of paper towel. towel. Yeah. It ate it. Yeah. 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 Because what happened yep. was is I I held it below it and so of course it it grabbed the pinky and it grabbed the paper towel and then it yep. wrapped it and so I was like oh shit here we go so I started tearing away the paper towel because I was like okay it'll let go of the pinky and then it'll drop the paper towel no big deal and so I left the room again. Came back, pinky was gone, paper towel was gone. Uh, kept an eye on it for a week, didn't feed it or anything like that. And finally, after uh, a week and a half, two weeks, it 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 gave it back up. And it was about the size of it was bigger than a quarter. It was. I have pictures of it. I'll have to send it to you. It's pretty interesting. But I mean, that snake's still here and it's still fine. Does great. But it was like crap. another reason to use water as your substrate. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just if if they can find a way to do something as dumb as possible with anything in the cage, they're gonna figure it out. Which is surprising Agreed. for a snake that lazy. You would think they wouldn't be that good at getting into things they're not supposed to. But mother of God, I have not had another snake 
do this amount of goofy shit as these green trees I know. Do. They're uh they're goofy and they're stupid. <laughs> they're very stupid animals. <laughs> but they know when it's food time, they're not they're not that dumb. No. They definitely know when it's time to eat. Which which is so ironic because those babies are can be such finicky little bastards. Yeah, they really go from but, zero to sixty. Like once they get going, they're going. Man, they they do. They do. And that's, you know, again, we've talked about so many of the fun aspects of keeping and breeding them. To get a baby to eat for the first time, man, you are just high-fiving yourself. It doesn't matter <laughs> if it's the first if it's the first clutch you've established or the hundredth. First time you see that baby eat, man, it's cool. Because with O'Kane's first clutch, he got all his to eat, like, the first time, right? He didn't have a single one. I don't. I, I I don't remember. Um, I I don't remember. It it doesn't surprise me. Those you know the Biak locality types are known to be they're they're pretty good feeders for mm-hmm. the most part on a on a hole coming out. Like the coffee owls, you hear the coffee owls and the arus tend to be the the worst yep. feeders as babies. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's awesome. It's like my first clutch. You know, I had a, I had a clutch of Aroos, eight babies, whatever, and they all just immediately just ate. Um, beginner's luck. Maybe a little. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe a little bit of beginner's luck. <laughs> yeah, Jake keeps giving me a hard time about these. He's like, well, what? Because his eggs are in a box below mine, and I keep threatening him that if he keeps talking shit that those eggs are going to go missing from the incubator. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, he's talking all this shit. Well, mine are going to hatch before yours. And he's like, have fun trying to get those things to eat, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, just wait. I'll bet you they all do. Well, if I could give you one piece of advice, it would be chick down. I've got a quail. And often. I've got a quail in the, in the freezer. Okay. Because when I had that baby from Luke that was giving me hard hard times, I uh, I tried that and it did absolutely nothing. <laughs> But the I've, quail. Got a, I've got a quail in there. Did the quail work or it didn't? It didn't. That snake didn't, didn't care what I was feeding it. It wasn't going to eat it. You know, um, another kind of funny uh, story is, is I had an animal here and uh, it wasn't feeding uh, strongly, properly, very erratic. Mm-hmm. So I gave it to Mark Hager and um, for some stupid reason, he decided to try to send it with parakeet feathers. And sure enough, he got it to eat. <laughs> he got it to eat with sending with parakeet feathers. And then, and then, so I was telling Brian this, and he had uh, Buddy Bashemi sent Brian two animals, gave him gave them the animals because they were not strong feeders. Mm-hmm. And these animals were probably six, seven months old at the time. And so I told Brian this. I go, you know, well, Mark, uh, he got him to get started on parakeet feathers. And Brian goes, oh, I'm going to try that. So he went to like two or three different pet stores looking for parakeet feathers, and nobody would give him any parakeet feathers. So <laughs> <laughs> so he told the story. He goes, I'm going to buy a parakeet, and I'm going oh, to euthanize it. And I'm going to use its feathers. And so then they gave him some parakeet feathers. <laughs> and, he, and he tried it, and I think he had mixed results with it. Um, but the bottom line is the two animals are now doing great. It, they just took some time to kick in. It's so strange that you can have some that just, they're absolute rock stars right out the gate. And then you just have those ones that just, for whatever reason, uh don't want to give it up i know i know it's um but again when they do when they do turn the corner if you, and you and you can get them to turn the corner it's really rewarding mm-hmm. also because i'm asking i'm asking all these questions because i'm curious because i'm trying to figure out what i'm going to do myself so I'm, I'm thinking of these as i go uh do you cut your eggs when it comes time when you see that first pip oh absolutely have you done I it without usually... have you just let them do it on their own at all no. no. To me, that's a tune of maternally incubating. I mean, you can do it. You can let them go. Yeah. 
and not PIP, but the um, the risk reward to me is um, I'm better off pipping the eggs. Now I will usually wait 24 hours. So in other words, if one pips or two pip, mm-hmm. I won't immediately just cut the eggs. I usually wait one day and then pip the rest. And you know, I, and I do that based on a couple different things: experience of other keepers, yep. which I think is real, really important, and my own experience with hundreds of ball python clutches. Mm-hmm. So and I mean, I think that's an individual in decision the, to do it or not do it. Yeah, in the ball python realm, though, have you like, did you notice major results as far as the babies? Uh, you know, of ones you cut versus you didn't cut? I think, was there anything substantial that stood out? You know, at first I would, I would do both. I would let clutches go and I would pip clutches. Mm -hmm. Um, And I noticed more animals dying in the egg that were not pipped. So, you know, did I perform a scientific study with a p-value? Right. No. It was individual observation. Um, and again, going on what other keepers that had more experience than I did, what, that, what tended to work for them. Because I'm so torn on that. Like, I, I'm a firm believer of natural selection. And I understand at the same time that when we're keeping and breeding these things in captivity, there's really nothing natural about it. But if those babies didn't hatch, was it meant to be in the first place? But once again, you know, you're, it's not natural that we're keeping them in boxes and breeding them selectively and all that stuff. Or, or incubating them artificially or yeah. just feeding them. You know, you can take that so many different levels. Um, bottom line for me is I just, wa- I, I just want to give the animal its best chance of survival. That's mm-hmm. That's all I care about. I, I don't know. I I obviously like the idea of not having to cut them and them all doing their thing, but I think everybody likes that idea. But that's not necessarily going to be the case. Yeah, oh. you know, again, it's uh, it's personal preference, and um, I just always fall back to what what do the majority of people that I respect that have more experience than I do, what do they do? Mm-hmm. And if I'm him hawing about one thing or another, that's usually my default. All right, man. Well, we're, we're approaching just under two hours. Wow. That went by fast. Yeah. Where can, uh, where can people find you? Um, probably the best way is on Facebook under Bill Stiegel. Um, I have a Facebook business page that's Phoenix Reptiles, but for whatever reason, people tend to associate more with with my uh, individual name and not my business name. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bill Stiegel, um, you know, on Facebook, uh, I am on Instagram as Phoenix Reptiles. Yep. Uh, You can email me. My email is wcstegmd at gmail.com, or my phone number is 817-239-2181. All right, man. Well, you're, I appreciate and you coming of course, on. Yeah, of course, GTP Keeper Radio, where you know, we, uh, we broadcast. This is our sixth, yeah, our sixth season to do the show, mm-hmm. so you can... Uh, it's most Find definitely worth checking there. out. And there's definitely some a lot of people on there that are worth listening to. And, uh, you know, I find myself going back to some episodes and listening to them again. You know. We've got some great guests. I mean, that's we do a lot of things wrong on that show. The one thing <laughs> we do right <laughs> is we got we have some great guests, phenomenal guests. Well, everyone needs to check it out. I'm sure a majority of the people that listen to this have have listened to to y'all before, but if you haven't and this is your first time listening to the show, GTP Keeper Radio, absolutely check it out. The more info on Condros, the better, which is the whole point of this show. You bet. Sharing is caring, man. That's right. 
All right. Man. Hey, Justin, thanks so much for having me on, buddy. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You bet. Talk to you. Take it easy.